So with over half the world's population now living in cities and with that number ever on the rise, we have to ask ourselves, how can we ensure that we make space for nature and that our cities are sustainable? In today's episode, we're going to be talking about city greening and everything relating to sustainability in our cities. We're going to be looking across the globe and seeing what's happening in the most sustainable cities on this planet. Well, maybe in other planets there's probably more sustainable cities, but I don't know about that. <laughs> but ultimately, we're going to look and see what the UK can learn. Let's get started with understanding what city greening is. And, well, not to give you the boring answer, it's simply making cities greener. Its relevance has grown massively over the past 50 years, along with our awareness of climate change and the negative effects we have on the planet, particularly from the development of our cities. Advancements in technology, architecture, and engineering has made city greening very exciting. I've traveled to London to see some of the examples this city has to offer, but before we do that, let's see what other places around the globe are currently doing. Now, uh, now that's definitely a su sustainable way to get around. We have to get started with Singapore, an incredibly innovative city looking decades into the future. Singapore is actually a relatively small island with around 5.7 million people packed into it. It's roughly half the footprint of London, so the city has to be really ingenuitive with how and why it builds. It's come up with one of the best public housing schemes in the world, which is known as HDB, and around 80% of the population live within these buildings. This housing doesn't just ensure quality of life for the people, but it also boosts the economy, making Singapore one of the richest countries in the world. And it's this money which helps provide you with the very picture you see in your minds when someone says the word Singapore. You think of its grand eco-architecture that quite frankly looks like it's from the future. So up until 2021, Singapore's airport won the best airport in the world eight years in a row. Interlaced between all of the usual things you'd expect to find in an airport, you're also going to find plant life seemingly clinging to every free space of the airport's interior. There are a number of themed gardens on the roof as well as a four-story tool collection of plants which encompasses a 40 meter tall rain vortex which is the tallest indoor waterfall in the world. Over the past 15 years, 25% of Singapore's buildings have become greened. This translates to around 62 million square meters and they're aiming to have over 80% of all buildings greened by 2030. This greening includes making use of space on top of buildings between and along the sides. But some buildings in Singapore, they just take it one step further. The supporting concrete within the Park Royal Hotel has literally been designed to resemble natural layers of earth and rock, and it also has extensive greening at all levels, including 15,000 square meters of tiered sky gardens. The Oasis Hotel is a tall and red green structure. The red, thanks to the tropical climate, is fast being replaced by the sprawling green life that encompasses 25,000 square meters of this building's exterior. Singapore's super trees are one of its most famed landmarks. Designed to resemble towering trees, visitors not only get to walk, hide between them being immersed in all of the wildlife, but also learn about the importance of trees to the planet. In 2018 alone, 18.5 million tourists flocked to Singapore to witness its unique green architectural feats. Another really awesome thing about Singapore are its controlled environment farms. While they're relatively new, the future of the city will rely upon how it gets its food. Having limited land for farming, Singapore imports 90% of its food, but they're changing this with controlled vertical farming. It's cool because it uses a fraction of the resources, anything can be grown anywhere and the farms can be stacked, so it's really only limited with how tall or how deep they need to be built. Copenhagen, along with Singapore, is another incredibly sustainable city. They're aiming to become the world's first carbon neutral city by 2025, and they're well on their way to doing just that. They've been able to boost the functioning of their existing buildings as they use district heating systems. That's many parts of the city all connected to just one plant. So all they have to do is switch that one plant over to renewable energy. Over the past 15 years, Copenhagen has cut down its emissions dramatically by switching to renewable energy. If you don't own a bike in Copenhagen, you're gonna look 
little bit out of place. There's five times as many bikes as cars, and over 300 million was invested in Copenhagen cycle routes, making it one of the most dedicated cycling cities in the world. Even some of the houses have been designed with bikes in mind, allowing you to ride your bike all the way up to the top floor. They're currently developing and boosting their metro lines to help get people around the city faster than they can in a car, as well as converting their buses to electricity. They're currently producing enough electricity from renewables to supply most of the city. Rather than relying on the very taxing air conditioning systems, the cool air is taken from seawater to cool their buildings during the summer. They turn their coal plants to use wood pellets and 98% of the city is heated using waste energy from its electricity production. One of Copenhagen's coolest sustainable feats is the waste to energy power plant that not only turns waste to power in a clean way, but it also has a ski slope on it. I mean, how cool is that? Not only do you get to visit and see all the good things that's going on, you also get to rip it down some slopes. Although Copenhagen is relatively small compared to other cities, with around a population of 790,000, they're certainly doing a lot to make their city green, and they are leading by example. So Copenhagen and Singapore are just two examples of cities that are really excelling when it comes to sustainability, and I'm sure there's many, many more cities which are doing great things. But what about London? In line with the Paris Agreement, London are aiming to become carbon negative by 2050. The mayor hopes to fast track this to 2030, and on a whole, it seems that efforts are being made, but there is still a lot more that needs to be done. London's biggest consumer of electricity is its public transport sector, the TfL, which is comprised of trains, buses and trams. The aim is to supply this sector with 100% renewable energy by 2030. It's important that this target is met, as there needs to be great emphasis on using public transport, walking, and cycling within the city, or in fact anything that just doesn't involve getting in a petrol or diesel car. London has 9,000 buses and they've recently been fitted with cleaner engines, of which 400 are fully electric, and overall there's now 90% less harmful emissions being released. The biggest emitter of nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide are passenger cars. The emissions not only contribute to climate change, but also the health of London's people. In 2019, the ultra-low emission zone was introduced to limit the use of vehicles within the heart of the city, and it has been effective, ensuring that cars releasing less emissions are used, or daily charges have to be paid for cars that are. The the cost of living in London is only rising, with the average house price being around 475000 and the average rent being around 1500 a month, and there's currently a housing shortage. There's been a few slogans along the lines of build back better and build, build, build come from the UK's leader Boris Johnson, but this has worried some designers and architects that shoddy unsustainable developments will be put forward. One project known as BedZ is the UK's first major zero carbon community and is found in London. Completed back in 2002, 100 homes were built with of course sustainability but also community in mind. Although it's been a success, which is largely due to the design and the people living there, nothing like this has since been replicated. So in no particular order now, I want to go through some of my key takeaways and what I think can start happening in some of the UK cities, particularly London and like all the other ones as well. So the first thing is we need to take on vertical farming. It just makes so much sense because much of the UK is actually dedicated to agricultural lands to growing crops. So imagine if we could cut, cut back on that, start rewilding that land and then within our cities we start producing crops. Like not only will this end up creating more jobs but it will also mean that that food is grown in the town. There's going to be no carbon footprint attached with transporting those goods across the world you can grow whatever you want with vertical farming it just seems like a no-brainer to me like just imagine like the big Tesco's like the big supermarkets in every town if they had like in their basements or even like stories up above where, where they were growing fresh produce which they could sell it just makes so much sense so another thing that I think should happen is like widespread greening of our cities. Like unlike vertical farming, which actually takes probably quite a lot of money and you have to build the facilities and everything, train the people, make sure you have all that in place. But one thing that can happen right now is the greening of our cities. You know, like every window can have like flowers growing from it, like up the buildings, I'm sure we can start growing vines. I just think that there needs to be more done because I like, looking around, walking around London today, I'm just, I'm like, all I'm seeing is just like concrete walls and not enough green. So I think coupled in with this is that every new development, like whether if it's large or small, has to be as eco-friendly as possible. It has to incorporate all of these things like green walls on the outside. They need to be designed well, they need, they, they need to be powered by renewable energy. It just, it, just, it just doesn't make sense, you know, to like go start going backwards now with the new builds. Everything has to be moving forwards. And this is where like le legislation comes in. This is where like governments and the people that actually make the decisions on policy, they, they need to say, look, it has to be like this or, or, or you can't do it. 
And just to touch on the whole legislation and policy thing again, like it's, it doesn't just apply to uh, developments, it should apply to like the running of businesses, like how we manage our parks, like how we, how everything is managed in the city. I just feel like it needs to be ramped up again and again and again. And you know, we've got this target of being carbon neutral by 2050. They're saying that they can do it by 2030. I don't know, let's just see, but if we're gonna do that, we need to go above and beyond. We need to shoot way further and then we'll probably land there, you know? So London's transport is great, like London is a big place and you know the tube line is fantastic, the buses are great, a lot of them are now electric uh, and, you, and you've also got the forest bikes, There's, there are some dedicated cycle lanes but this is something which I think which we can learn like especially from Copenhagen is that we should try and become a cycling city, we should be changing our inf infrastructure to be supporting bikes and like other like forms of like like I don't know maybe like the scooters or like any other way that isn't getting in like a fossil fuel car I walked around for about an hour on foot today and I saw way more cars than I did bikes and I, I and I only saw one dedicated like truly dedicated like bike lane where like there was like barriers either side to like make it really safe like everywhere you look in London there there's just cars like right now like I'm seeing a few buses but there's just cars everywhere and two it's worth mentioning that if you take the bike if you go for a walk you're gonna be in better health, you're gonna be in better shape. So I feel like that needs to be pressed along with like the good that you can do for the environment. So I guess the next key takeaway, and, then, and this might be my last, I mean, I might think of something in a minute, but I guess my next key takeaway is like, we need to have a cultural change. There needs to be a shift in the way that societies and communities, individuals, Think about the planet, think about their place, think about their actions, think about what impact that they can have. Because everybody, at the end of the day, has a different set, set of circumstances, everyone has a different set of skills, some people can run businesses, maybe you're like a high school kid, maybe you could like start studying and, and like writing a paper, like my point is, is like use what power you have, use what skill set you have to try and make a difference. I mean like, not that I'm the best at this, but I feel like the way that I can try and make a difference is by making these videos. So maybe like have a little thing, think to yourself like what is it that I can offer and how can I put that out in the world? But yeah, you know, I think that's it. Some closing words. I really feel like it is going to take like the change of individuals, but more fundamentally to actually have like big impacts in cities. It's going to take like the change of governments. It's going to take governments to stop looking four or five years in into the future and start thinking about the future 50 to 100 years down the line. The UK is a very privileged country. We've got a lot of resources. So I personally feel like we should start using them to make our cities a greener and more sustainable place. All right, that's it for me. If you enjoyed it, please like the video. Please like leave whatever feedback that you want down in the comments. I love talk, chat, chatting to you guys down there. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Leave curious. This is the back and this is the front. Cool, right?